Her silver was trotting through the grass to a darkling stream beneath a sea of stars. A corpse stood at the prow of a ship, eyes bright in his dead face, gray lips smiling sadly. A blue flower grew from a chink in a wall of ice and filled the air with sweetness. Mother of dragons, bride of fire. In a clash of kings at the house of the undying, Danny receives this sequence of images, the so-called bride of fire vision. And this has caused ample debate on what exactly it's supposed to mean. Well, as it turns out, Danny's Bride of Fire vision, namely the last part involving the blue flower, actually describes the entire story of the Wall and beyond, from John's participation in the Great Ranging, to his election, to his ultimate stabbing. It encompasses our entire Night's Watch series. And the vision is more. It's a grand scheme and a devious overarching plan of the largest magnitude. The vision represents what I call the War of the Raven. Now, figuring out prophecy is a difficult task. Metaphors can fit almost anything, and no interpretation is really thoroughly provable or falsifiable. That said, when looking at the Bride of Fire vision, it's difficult to argue that the first part of the vision doesn't evoke Danny's wedding night with Khal Drogo in A Game of Thrones. They rode out together as the stars came out, leaving the Kalisar and the Grass Palaces behind. Afterwards, she could not say how far or how long they had ridden, but it was full dark when they had stopped, at a grassy place, beside a small stream. So with both Danny's wedding night and the vision, we have Danny riding her silver, we have grass, stars, a stream, and it all relates to Danny being a bride. We have seemingly identified the first part of the vision. And although perhaps a bit more debatable, the second part of the Bride of Fire vision does seem to show the arrival of Victorian Greyjoy in Slaver's Bay. As he stood at the prow of the Iron Victory watching One Ear's merchant ships vanish one by one into the west, the faces of the first foes he'd ever slain came back to Victorian Greyjoy. He thought of his first ship, of his first woman. A restlessness was in him, a hunger for the dawn and the things this day would bring. Death or glory, I will drink my fill of both today. The sea stone chair should have been his when Balon died, but his brother Euron had stolen it from him, just as he had stolen his wife many years before. He stole her, and he soiled her, but he left it for me to slay her. And so here we have a man dying of an infection at the prow of a ship, a corpse. He is eager for battle. To be eager is to be bright-eyed. And he has a whole slew of contradictory emotions. Grey lips, smiling sadly. And of course, Victorian is seeking Danny as his bride. We have seemingly identified the second part of the vision. Which brings us to the third part. A blue flower grew from a chink in a wall of ice and filled the air with sweetness. So what could this vision mean, and how does it relate to our entire Night's Watch series? Well, almost without saying, the mentioning of a wall of ice immediately makes us think of John, our main protagonist associated with the wall. And yes, there are hundreds of other characters associated with the Wall, and John isn't even at the Wall when this vision is received. Still, with John being such a prominent character, we can't help but to look to the John story for answers on what a sweet-smelling blue flower growing from a chink in a wall could be. Now, I will say, many out there jump to the conclusion that this vision is some sort of clue of John's parentage. After all, Lyanna liked blue roses and was given a crown of blue roses, and later Danny tells Jora that the blue flower in her vision is in fact a blue rose. But this explanation is at best incomplete and at worst rather misleading. How on earth does parentage fill the world with sweetness? How does parentage create a chink in the wall? Why should any character at the wall or beyond give a damn about Lyanna Stark or parentage? Not to mention, there are many other blue flowers referenced in our story. Loras's armor at the Hand's Tourney had blue flowers. A prostitute at Shatai's brothel wore blue flowers. Brienne's sigil is blue and rose. Why are Lyanna's blue flowers more important than these other blue flowers? And why would a character like Lyanna liking something translate to it being a symbol of her supposed child. No, the blue flower or blue rose must actually fit the vision. We must find the right blue rose and apply it correctly. 
Now, as it turns out, this search for the right blue flower is not actually a very long or difficult quest. Just three chapters after Danny visits the House of the Undying in Daenerys IV, A Clash of Kings, we come to Jon's story north of the Wall in Jon VI, where he meets Egret, and she tells him the tale of Bale the Bard and the Winter Rose, a blue flower. And we are explicitly told of Jon's interpretation of this story. She told me Mance would take me if I ran with her. She told you true. She even claimed we were kin. She told me a story of Bale the Bard and the Rose of Winterfell. So Stone Snake told me. It happens I know the song. Mance would sing it of old when he came back from arranging. He had a passion for wildling music. Aye, and for their women as well. So according to John and Corin, we know exactly what the Blue Rose means, that the Wildlings and the Northmen, or at least the Starks, are kin. I discuss all of this a lot more in the Schemes of the Half Hand series and why exactly Corin wanted John to come along with him. And besides John and Corin, this story of northern kinship is also the clear belief of the characters that revere the story of the Winter Rose, namely Mance and Egret. Both of them specifically tell us that Starks and Wildlings are one. Now, as it happens, this interpretation of the Blue Rose being kinship fits the vision of a flower filling the world with sweetness perfectly. It's a message of unity, a sweet message. And it's a message that John takes to heart after his relationship with Egret. He sympathizes with the Wildlings, he sees them as people, and he goes on to want to help them. In fact, in A Dance with Dragons, the John story is utterly consumed by his desire to save the Wildlings. And it's this same desire to save the Wildlings that creates conflict at the Wall, a chink. As discussed in great detail in our Daggers for John series, John's desire to save the Wildlings in A Dance with Dragons is played against Bowen Marsh's concern that it's weakening the Night's Watch. And in fact, this sweet idea of unity does weaken the Night's Watch creating a food shortage and concluding with a dire conflict at the Wall. With the Watch fighting the Wildlings, Queensmen, and Northmen, it is distracted and weakened, and who knows, perhaps even some sort of actual physical damage could happen to the Wall itself. And if we go back and examine Jon's time with Egret, our storyteller of the Rose of Winter, we find a tale focused almost entirely on Northern Unity, hating the Wall, or circumventing the Wall. Egret first tells Jon of the Winter Rose and kinship, then she helps John join the Wildlings. Then she sings of the Giants and laments the building of the Wall. Then she tells of Gorn's Way going beneath the Wall. Then she climbs the Wall while telling John how she hates it. And finally, she attacks the Wall and dies in the process. Everything about the Egret storyline is about hating walls, either literally with the actual Wall, or figuratively with it being a barrier between the Northmen and the Wildlings. To Egret, the Winter Rose and the Wall are antithetical. One is unity, the other separation. And of course, if the idea of unity grows, it by definition would weaken the idea of separation. And we all get the sense that the others will eventually attack south. The how of it is a mystery. Perhaps the Wall will fall, perhaps the others will go through a gate, perhaps they will go around the Wall, perhaps over it or underneath it, through Gorn's Way. Regardless of how it happens, we have seen in our story, and especially A Dance with Dragons, that the Wall and the Night's Watch have been distracted, decimated, and weakened. Inarguably, the Wall is now easier to get past or get around. A chink has formed. And in the A Dance with Dragons storyline, it was created by Jon's belief in unity, something he learned from his time with Egret. So, if the Blue Rose represents unity and kinship, or someone who believes in unity and kinship, does this mean Danny will be a bride for Jon, just as she was a bride for Khal Drogo and a desired bride for Victarion? Well, who knows? Maybe. Probably. I will say that the vision of the Blue Rose works just as well for Mance Raider as it does for Jon. Mance also loves the story of the Winter Rose, sees the Wildlings and the Northmen as one, and has actively tried to take down the Wall. So it could be him as well, and that would make a more interesting story. So it could be Mance, but probably Jon, but regardless of who it is or if it's someone else, this is actually not the most interesting aspect of the Bride of Fire vision. No, the most interesting thing about the vision is the fact that the latter two parts are bona fide predictions of the future. Victarion did stand at the prow of a ship, bright-eyed, smiling sadly, and a sweet blue flower did grow from a chink in the wall. That is, a message of unity did weaken the wall and the Night's Watch. 
events from A Dance with Dragons and the Winds of Winter were seemingly known all the way back in A Clash of Kings. But how can this be? How can one know the future? Well, this gets at the very nature of prophecy in our story, and so let's shift gears and talk about prophecy. When it comes down to it, there are two ways to know the future. First, there is knowing the future in a predictive sense, which is the regular, everyday way that you and I can manage. One can predict that one will eat breakfast tomorrow, that the sun will rise, that in four months one will go on vacation. There is nothing very special about this, it simply requires information and the ability to extrapolate, though success gets harder and harder the more distant in the future the events are and the number of factors involved that are out of one's control. The second way of knowing the future is in a retrospective sense, to somehow have already seen or experienced what is yet to come. This is the fantastical way that doesn't exist in our world as far as we know. This requires either some sort of supernatural timeless deity, a god or the fates or something like this, or it requires time travel. Now, whether knowing the future is predictive or retrospective, it seems to require a rational mind. Someone or something needs to either plan or extrapolate, in the case of the predictive, or someone or something needs to experience future events supernaturally, in the case of the retrospective. And this is actually a rather big deal. Either someone was powerful enough to examine the events of Victorian and John's stories with such detail that they could predict their outcomes years in advance, or someone was powerful enough to be capable of time travel. Either way, someone very, very powerful is watching the John story. Now, we are not sure where exactly the visions of the House of the Undying came from. Shade of the Evening seems to tap into something or someone to retrieve these visions, but we have no idea who or what. Were they from someone who has mastered time? A god? Bran in the Weirwood Net? Or were they simply from an incredibly powerful schemer and planner? Someone who could predict and manipulate all of this? It's difficult to say at this point, and it may even be that there are multiple competing schemers pulling strings. But two things are for certain, though. First, as I said before, someone with incredible power is watching the story at the wall, and second, they are trying to affect change. In fact, Danny's vision proves this point. A vision, at its very nature, implies the intent to affect outcome, and our author is well aware of this fact. Let's take a look at a very, very important discussion between Mira and Jojen. Her brother shook his head. The things I see in green dreams can't be changed. That made his sister angry. Why would the gods send a warning if we can't heed it and change what's to come? I don't know, Jojen said sadly. So Mira brings up an excellent question. What is the whole point of prophecy? Jojen has no good answer because there is no good answer. It's a contradiction. Prophecy attempts to show an inevitable future, but if the future were set, then there is absolutely no need for prophecy in the first place. Everyone could just sit back, not worry, and let the future just happen. Paradoxically, prophecy, a supposed vision of a set future, proves that the future is not set. Mira is right. Prophecy must have a purpose. It must be intended to affect change. Now, in some other story, I could buy an author throwing in prophecy and not thinking about its fundamental nature. But this conversation between Mira and Jojen shows that George R. R. Martin is well aware of the contradiction. Danny's vision, by its very nature, shows that someone out there is trying to shape the uncertain future of the wall. But let's delve into Mira's question a bit more. Yes, a vision is trying to affect change, but in a more specific sense, what is its purpose? And is there a way for both Mira and Jojen to be right, to resolve the contradiction? Well, a vision could theoretically have two purposes in its desire to affect change, and they would be in direct opposition to each other. There can be a desire for conformity to the vision, and a desire for non-conformity to the vision. Let's start with non-conformity. A vision's purpose could be a warning for a non-desirable future. Say you receive a vision of getting hit by a car tomorrow. You would probably stay inside hoping to avoid the deadly crash. And then there's conformity. A vision may want events to occur by presenting them. Say you receive a vision of lottery numbers. You would probably play those numbers. And of course, there may be deceptive, self-fulfilling visions that pose as warnings, but are secretly visions that are pushing conformity. Say you receive a vision of getting hit by a car, so you stay inside, only to be hit by a car in your house. The act of trying not to have the prophecy happen makes the prophecy happen. This is actually the nature of prophecy in the Oedipus story, where Oedipus leaves his parents to avoid a prophecy, only to run into his real parents to fulfill it. 
With regard to these deceptive, self-fulfilling prophecies, Cersei's friend Malaria Heatherspoon actually puts forward some incredible wisdom when she claims that a forgotten prophecy couldn't come true. And one could argue that deceptive, self-fulfilling prophecy is a way to reconcile Mira and Jojen's argument. Why would the gods send a warning if we can't heed it and change what's to come? A possible answer is to cause the recipients to actively try to conform to it, either by motivating them into action or tricking them into action. In fact, Jojen, despite claiming that visions must come true, is rather motivated to fulfill what he has seen. And so with a vision of a blue flower growing in a chink in a wall, we have to ask ourselves, is the purpose of this vision to warn people of a chink in the wall, that is, nonconformity, or is the purpose of the vision to create a chink in the wall, that is, conformity? Was the weakening of the Night's Watch and the wall in the John story something that occurred despite the grand plans of a powerful actor? Or was the weakening of the Night's Watch and the wall the desired result of the grand plans of a powerful actor? We know a powerful actor is watching the wall, and we know a powerful actor wants to affect change. But what is their true purpose? What is the goal of the War of the Raven? And that is the question we'll delve into next time as we examine the events of the wall and beyond. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.